yeah. to start recording. I'm just going to ch shut it out. So, uh, Eric, thanks a lot for, for being here. Um, the, um, oh, God damn it. Okay, I start again because it's like... Okay. <laughs> intro. Uh, I, will, I will record a separated intro, you know, like with, with a couple of yeah, achievements sure. and whatnot, you know, and just a, uh, yeah. a short recap of the recap of the whole thing so i just uh hop, okay. we hop in into the conversation right away sure no problem all right eric thanks a lot for being here um it's um i why why the heck did <laughs> I, can, I can't find a start point god damn it <laughs> i do, i do exactly the same thing i just have these mental blanks um, yeah, yeah. So it's easy. It's easy me being on this <laughs> end. It's much more difficult you being on that end. Exactly. So, it's like I also have to find the time, flow, just, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, <laughs> you'll find the flow. Just make it conversational. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Eric, thanks a lot for being here. Um, I take it like your last trip was really awesome as well. Where have you been? Yeah. Well, great to be with you first, Philip. And uh, yeah. look, I'm locked down here in Tasmania, Australia, where I live, of course. And our borders are closed, even to uh, interstate travel. So people on the mainland in Australia can't come down to Tasmania and we can't leave. So I'm a captive audience for the Tasmanian wilderness. Even my family aren't here because they're over on the mainland and they got oh. locked down. So I've had three months during my favourite season, winter, of just mm -hmm. having back-to-back -back micro adventures. And my last one, I just got back two days ago. It was just a simple overnight trip, but it was, I think, maybe the last snow that we've got for the year, for the, for the season. And I just did an overnight snowshoeing trip and, um, and seeing some of the most incredible uh, landscape that we have that's only a bit over an hour drive from my home. Very lucky. Uh, yeah, I saw the pictures, and um, it looked pretty awesome. But it was also quite wet, huh? Or yeah, well, well, the, no. The last trip we had, uh, I had great weather. It was, uh, in fact, I went because I knew that I, there wouldn't be any rain, there wouldn't be any snow. With the snow was finished, and so we had clear sky. Uh, I keep saying we, but it was me out there. Maybe, <laughs> maybe me, maybe me and my snowshoes. Yeah. Um, and uh, no, it was a pretty, a pretty simple trip. But um, you know, it was an area that I hadn't been to before. Yeah. Okay. But is it um, close to the area that have, you have behind you at the moment in your background? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's exactly right. So, so what I was my virtual background. It's not as if I live up on a mountain top and hey, this is my view. Hey, like, hey it around. looks like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, but yes, this is very typical of what I was seeing just a few days ago. Yeah, Tasmania okay. has very unique wilderness. We have very distinctive looking mountains. We have a lot of high mountain lakes, small lakes that we call tarns. And, uh, and we get uh, snow just like, uh, you know, many other parts around the world do in wintertime. Um, they get more snow on the mainland in Australia. And the reason I'm not on the mainland during wintertime is because my season was canceled. Normally mm. I'm guiding uh, backcountry uh, skiing and snowshoeing and sledding expeditions all of that got cancelled um, and I was locked down here in Tassie spending time in that kind of wilderness yeah okay but how come that you couldn't um, wasn't it possible for you to go over to the mainland and then just quarantine for a while well yes I, I could have gone over to the mainland but the problem is that many of my uh, my guests come from Victoria Okay. In, which is a state of Australia. Mm -hmm. And I heard that this made international news, but uh, mm -hmm. Melbourne in particular had a, a big spike of transmissions, of uh, mm -hmm. COVID transmissions. Mm -hmm. And so they went into stage four lockdown. So, and my son and my wife happened to be in Melbourne at the time. So they've been locked there for almost three months um, mm -hmm. ever since. So, and because a lot of my customers come from Victoria to New South Wales, to the Kosciuszko region, they actually couldn't leave their state to join me up there. So most okay. of my clientele, uh, you know, had to cancel. So I had to cancel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, the problem with the, with the lockdowns and in particular is that it's still a lot of stuff still getting either postponed or even canceled. So, I mean, that's we, right. And, 
Yeah, in fact, you know, um, ALE, Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions, who, with whom I've been working for many, many years, mm. um, bringing them customers, uh, have actually worked for them uh, many years ago. They cancelled their Antarctic season for the upcoming Austral summer. And um, of course, that's a big pity, but, you know, it was uh, just something that had to be done. Mm. Um, Cape Town seems to be open for people passing through to Antarctica. In fact, I got an email from a friend yesterday who will spend the, the uh, Antarctic summer down south. Okay. Uh, he's one of very few, but I think he's working for a government operation. Okay. Uh, but I don't know yet of any you know, tourist operations mm. that are 100% confirmed operating in Antarctica this coming season. So, yeah, there are still cancellations happening now. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, it's interesting. That's that's exactly what I wanted to put, uh, point out on uh, the this Antarctica season that it's like still in jeopardy, pretty much, or even yeah, not, not going to happen at all. You know. So, um, well, 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 Philip, as you know, you know, we both work in Svalbard, yeah. uh, particularly during the spring season, March, April, northern spring this time, mm. uh, you know, because I, I work in two, both hemispheres. So I have to be careful if I say summer, I have to be very specific about which summer yeah. I'm talking about. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but we often see each other uh, up in Longyearbyen or... Yeah bumping into each other out in the wilderness in Svalbard. Exactly. And, that's what I kind um, of was hoping for this season as well. <laughs> well, well, that's exactly right. In fact, I did fly into Svalbard and as I was flying in with my daughter, they closed the borders and they booted us straight out again. But, mm -hmm. you know, you and I would both be very concerned about the season running next year. Yeah, March, exactly. April. We, we have no confirmation that we can operate our trips. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was, um, I'm currently th uh, thinking and planning for, for the whole season, basically. And I was um, talking with, uh, uh, in terms of like the North Pole expedition season and stuff like that. And they're actually like still on the go, basically. Like they're still thinking it's going to happen. But of course, in, yeah, in my yeah. case, it's a bit more easy because um, I can, since I'm living in Sweden, I can go over to the northern part of Norway, you know, quarantine myself in Tromsø and yeah. then still be able to get up there. But, yeah. uh, for... well, 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 the complication, the complication there, of course, is that uh, Norway and Svalbard are close to um, everything but essential travel. So mm. if you can convince yeah. the government that, you know, <laughs> yeah. running dog sled trips in Norway yeah, exactly. or Svalbard is essential, like uh, ski touring with a sled around Svalbard is essential, exactly. then- I mean, for us, it there. is. <laughs> It is for us. It's it is absolutely essential for our cycle, you know, for our exactly. psyche, for our mental go. health. Uh, but it remains to be seen whether we will see each other in Svalbard. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, <laughs> you're totally right. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's still long, a long way to go. Yeah. But yeah. But before we are able to do those big adventures, of course, like there is plenty of small stuff that we can do. Um, but um, do you do you already have like a sort of like in external plan or or a site plan if things are not going well like i mean uh like yeah well or you know Spania or something like that you know focus a little bit more on those kind of things yeah yes well that's been the status quo ever since my family went across to the mainland and tasmania locked down its borders so mm -hmm. i have had a string of back-to-back -back adventures probably 10 micro adventures around tasmania mm -hmm. um and that started just before my family went to Victoria when I did a, just an overnight sea kayak mm -hmm. around uh, North Bruni Island, which is an island that's only half hour drive from here. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful part of the island that's, uh, that you can paddle around. There's an isthmus, a small narrow neck joining two parts of the island. And I drag my sea kayak over, over the other side and then paddle back up to my car. So a beautiful overnight trip and I saw you know, wedge-tailed eagles, I saw penguins, I saw, you know, beautiful uh, sea life seals. Mm -hmm. um, so, you, you know, you don't have to go far to, to really experience wonderful wind wilderness here in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's the beauty of living in a place like this and being interested in the outdoors, mm -hmm. that everything's on my doorstep here. I don't have to fly to Svalbard to have a great wilderness adventures or fly to Antarctica or to Greenland or whatever. I do that for a living and it's wonderful, but I can have, you know, equally 
pleasant, wonderful, but small adventures down here in Tasmania. And since that one, I've been regularly hiking, snowshoeing and sea kayaking all around Tasmania. And I still have more trips lined up and probably leaving on Sunday for the biggest one. Oh, okay. Where are you heading? Mm. You're already... So, yeah, yeah, I've got that one sorted out. Uh, I've actually been waiting all winter for a good weather window to hike what's called the Western Arthurs, which is a mountain range in southwest Tasmania. Um, many consider it the, the hardest bushwalk or hike in, in Australia, and it is. It's quite a committing hike. It's much more tame than it was let's say 30, 40 years ago when, you know, the track wasn't developed, um, mm. very few people were doing it. Uh, there were no such thing as EPIRBs and PLBs and satellite phones and, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> mobile. I think even parts of this remote range, you even have mobile reception these days. Mm. But it's, it doesn't take away from the fact that it's still a human face-to-face -face with the wilderness you know, mm. and, and with the weather and with the slippery rocks and with the icy rocks on the, on the southern faces and with the, the dense undergrowth and the mud holes and the bog holes. It's still, yeah, I still love that human interaction. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's part of being out there, even though I might meet people along the way, even though I might see a track marker here and there, mm. it's still um, an interaction between human and wilderness. And this is beneficial for everybody that goes out into the wilderness. It's a, it's a great, um, it's a great way of keeping you sane and tuning your <laughs> mental health and your, and your physical health as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How did you, uh, what, how, how many hours, uh, how many days do you plan on going out there? you know well i'll take six nights of food okay. in a backpack so i'll be hiking snowshoeing's finished now for the season I, okay. I don't expect any snow out there um so it's not a particularly long hike but yeah. um well. but it does it but but well but it does demand of you to reduce everything and part of the planning mm. that you and i like of course you know mm. conducting expeditions is looking at the equipment which equipment is suitable? Which equipment in the past have I come back and, and said to myself, I've never pulled that out of my pack and never used it in the last mm. two years. I'm not going to take this on my next expedition. I've always ended up with too much food. This time I'm going to pair that right back. Um, how much power have I consumed along the way on my mobile phone or my maybe my rechargeable headlamp? Um, am I carrying too much? Am I carrying too little? So this, this, th these logistics and this fine tuning is part of the fun of being out there. So in a room just next to me here, um, I've got laid out all of this gear um, oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm still deciding what I'll take and what I won't take. But I've got mm. all of tomorrow to sort that out. <laughs> so what are you thinking of in particular? Like uh, what, what items do you still not 100% sure? Like what are you going to take? <laughs> well, you know, it, th this hike in particular is pretty tricky in that there are some really steep descents. And on these steep descents, it's very typical to need to lower your pack down and then Ooh, down okay. climb afterwards, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's pretty committing stuff. Yeah, okay. So I have to take a rope and some carabiners to lower stuff down. And sometimes you've got to push your packs up between cracks in the rocks. So if you have a backpack that has, you know, ski poles or hiking poles strapped to the outside or a cup for scooping up water for drinking or mm. a, a bedroll or something th they're going to get caught up in there so everything has to fit inside the pack you can't have anything on the outside mm. um and you know i walk with ski poles more and more these days maybe because i'm almost 60 and you know i find that uh my body kind of relies <laughs> on them more and more um but i actually find them as useful tools for uh, lots of things for supporting my body and maybe breaking them apart as ski po as um snow pegs for my tent what you know when i do have deeper snow mm. um but it's like will i take them or won't i take them what will i do them if i need to squeeze my bag up through this crack you know they'll be in the way or or when I'm lowering down, they can get caught here and there. Mm. Oh, sorry, is that my phone? Just hang on a moment. Yep. I'm gonna turn that. I'm gonna turn that phone off. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't. I 
I can't mute that phone because it's a home line. Uh-huh. Um, old school, um, huh? <laughs> yeah, old school. That's right. Yeah, I know. Um, and, uh, you know, what type of stove that I'll take? Um, I have a s- smaller, lighter system. It's a gas, you know, obviously in places where, it, where it's extremely cold, we use a liquid stove, pressurized, like a MSR XGK or ex- uh, expedition stove. Mm-hmm. But here in Tasmania, I prefer the gas cylinders and, a, mm-hmm. you know, a screw on stove. Yeah. And I've got a super light system, but you've got to weigh up does the super light system that doesn't have the capacity for um for trapping the heat and do you end up using more gas and needing to take more gas than if you take a slightly heavier thing like the msr wind burner or the jet boil you know which is an all-encompassing system Uh -uh. which is uh, more economical with its gas use so um, these are the kind of, you know, world decisions that we have to make on, on these uh, challenging little <laughs> micro adventures, but it's part of the fun. Yeah, for sure. But how is it like in terms of shoes? Because uh, I just recently had this discussion with a, with a friend of mine. She's like, uh, she has problems with her ankle that she's basically like, you know, has a tendency to, to, uh, slip and so Roll. Uh, so she needs, yeah, exactly, roll the ankle. So she needs a more stable shoe, basically. I personally, I go more and more away from this because uh, usually the Gore-Tex doesn't really hold up very well when it's wet. You know, they're getting wet from the inside anyway. They're heavy since they're also soaking water in the end. So I'm more and more, since I started more and more trail running, I'm actually going more and more to the to trail running shoe because it also has much more better grip on, in particular, when you go like, uh, scramble up a mountain or whatever you you're much mm. faster you're much more flexible yeah. those kind of things so how how is your take on that part I, i'm still pretty old school with that so mm. i've got a pretty heavy duty pair of boots they're a leather boot they're gore-tex lined mm. but i wear a seal skin sock so yeah. you know the moisture generated by my feet while i'm walking doesn't go into the boot and make the boot wet from the inside and because they're gore-tex lined and because i treat the leather before i leave for waterproofing mm-hmm. i can do a pretty decent wet hike and mm-hmm. and also wearing gaiters over the top i can do a, a pretty extended hike in wet conditions and keep my feet relatively dry mm-hmm. You know, but Tasmania, they, they don't really stay dry for that long because we have some stretches where you're literally walking in deep puddles, sometimes mm. up to your knees. And I've some seen some people plunge up to their hips or deeper in puddles, <laughs> you know, on, on the trails. Nothing keeps that out. And we have river crossings too. You know, yeah. Tasmania, of course, is full of mountains and rivers and uh, mm. And every day we need to wade across streams and rivers to get to the other side. So, um, but I do like the old school boot because it gives me the ankle stability, Mm. you know, with a heavy pack on the back, I just find that a trail running shoe doesn't give me the ankle support that I'm after. Um, And, 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 and the other primary thing is the type of sole that you've got on your footwear. You know, as you know, you need something like a 510 rubber in the kind of environment that I'm going to, which is really sticky and grippy and great for climbing and, and bouldering and so on. Whereas, um, and I was talking about this to a friend yesterday who was, who had been on a hike just in a pair, of, they weren't even trail shoes. They were like a pair of jogging shoes. Yeah, that doesn't um, track. <laughs> he said that they, were, they were like being on, like being on ice skates. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the footwear, like everything else, is, uh, is um, a very important choice. And I think it comes down to exactly that, just a personal choice. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, for me, it's, um, I mean, by the time this, this airs, I hopefully have finished this already. I'm going to go out next week on a 340-kilometer a uh, trail hike, basically. But um, wow. in, in, uh, and planning on basically doing that in three and a half days so that means like no sleep uh and super lightweight so that even like wow. means like i'm not even having uh a, a stove with me no uh no sleeping bag no nothing basically you know so it's like the only thing that i'm gonna uh, take that's super light yeah, yeah yeah but it's um it's quite funny because um when i was 
trail running now on on a little bit longer runs and so on actually like ran on trails that were where hikers like would go out like for several days or whatever it's really interesting to see like how how inexperienced some people are in that that they actually take way too much stuff with them and um that tends to discourage people as well i guess it's because yeah yeah because if you if you have this um mental mindset in there like oh i have to have this with me i have to have that with me and then you start hiking i mean i made those those mistakes as well uh six years ago i think it was uh, i went on a long hike um on the northern kungsleden in sweden the king's trail uh the main one basically that is like 550 to 600 kilometers and i was wearing a 130 liter back battle guns backpack you know with an outer frame and uh, just oh wow uh and only one resupply spot so that means like i started out with like 36 kilo on my back you know so wow okay yeah. uh, and uh those well that's yeah that's an it's yeah it's an entire different philosophy you know and it's exactly. completely at odds with uh with the current movement or or even industry now the through hikers yeah. you know you see some of the equipment that's coming out as a result of this movement where we're seeing ultra light stuff, you know, that, that people are taking. Um, and, and they're picking up resupplies along the way because they can't carry food. They, they physically don't carry a backpack that's big enough to yeah, carry yeah. more than just a few nights of food. So they have to put in little depots and caches here and there or assume that they can drop into a town and pick up supplies and so on. But um, um, yeah, I've, it, it doesn't appeal to me that much because part of the reason for me to be out there is to engage with the wilderness for as, for as long as I need to. Yeah. And, um, you know, people do this Western Arthur's hike, uh, as trail runners in 16 hours or so. Mm. Um, and that's great, but I want to be out there. I want to spend nights in my tent. I want to look out at the stars. I want to feel the rain. I want to just engage with everything that being in, in Tasmania means. Um, and I feel like I would be doing Tasmania a disservice if I was just dashing through really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fair point for sure. I mean, that's the, that's exactly what also like, what should be the focus on most people's mind is exactly slow down and do that i mean in, in my case the only reason why i'm doing that is because that is the only way for me to challenge myself because as you know i have sled dogs and with with them i would never do those kind of things i would never mm. uh push them because uh if i push them you know it's like because then it's like over my own attitude basically and my own goals and that would never be the case with my dogs because uh if I challenge myself, then it's about me and only about me, no one else, you know, it's the yeah. same like when, yeah. when being out yeah. with guests or whatever, you when know, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, that would be the last thing on your mind is like starting to push on, you know, so, so yeah. those kind of things, That's it's right. like, it's it definitely out of the question. So therefore it's like, uh, it's nice to just once in a while challenge yourself, you know, while you're still yeah. young in brackets, you know, and then, but everything <laughs> else is like, <laughs> it's a little bit like i remember those days <laughs> yeah well you're not uh you you said in in the other podcast the other day that you have been never uh fitter like in in a long time you know yeah like right yeah. now so. that's exactly right yeah yeah I mean, I've never really had that much weight to lose. I, I've always been, you know, reasonably slender and that's just a genetic thing. Yeah. Um, but I've probably lost a couple of kilos, I think, over the course of winter because of all of these expeditions, you know. And, and, and early on when COVID first kicked in, I got my bike trainer out. So I was on my bike, you know, probably for an hour a day for a couple of months or so. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that is, um, you know, keeps me fit keeps me healthy um and so that you know when our seasons do kick off again i'll be in good shape and yeah. for these local trips that i'm doing too um you need to be in good shape for those too because it's very challenging terrain here in tassie but do you do a specific training for those kind of expeditions i mean since you're dragging a, a sled behind you basically uh that also requires a little bit more strength like in in the upper upper part of the mm. body 
other than you know because bicycling is a little bit more like lower body based basically and then uh the upper body also needs a certain amount of training yeah. i guess but how do you do that yeah so i've never been a gym guy i mm. think i've been into a gym maybe three <laughs> or four times in my lifetime um and that's not saying anything against gyms it's just not what i do um uh, so judo judo is something that i've been doing for most mm. of my life it's a mm -hmm. real full body workout uh, it's as much upper body as as it is legs and um mm. and that's a couple of nights a week uh, a minimum of one night a week at least and that's a really good solid workout particularly mm. you know i'm 58 pushing 60 and I still fight and have the mentality of an 18 year old. So, you know, I front up with these other, with these other judoka who are half my age, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm still fighting with the same vigor and the same, <laughs> the same belief that I had, you know, all those years ago. And by a large, by a large, it works out. I, I'm still able to hold myself. And I think, you know, part of that is, just the repetition in your life if you go through a long period in your life which a lot of people do maybe when they first start to climb the corporate ladder or they get they have a family that might slow them down or there could be a whole host of reasons where they forget about their fitness they forget about their health they forget about the, the hobbies that they had as young people they forget about the loves of their life and they get caught into other things that are important as well mm -hmm but are often um, at the expense of their health and fitness. And I just think it's important to set aside some time, irrespective of all, those, all of those other things, to, to keep active, to keep fit. It's, it's, the, it's the one thing that, that leads to good health um, later on in life. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know if you've seen those pictures, but uh, a while ago, I basically uh, put out a uh, upper body like uh, I was you know topless and I, I had my dogs okay, around yeah. basically uh, promoting the, um, the the problem that I see quite often in sled dogs that they are just overweight you know and that um, mm. is, is the it's the same problem with us as well obviously uh, that you're just getting lazy and just or just even though you're working out you know you just shove way too much food into your protein powders and all that kind of garbage that you can just shove into yeah. your mouth but uh the point that i want to want to make is like a friend of mine he's uh 64 years old christer i think he's 64 he's a farmer and you see uh, he he did the same basically you know like had a had a picture of him you know with one of his dogs mm -hmm. and he's a sled dog guide as well you know for many many years they do that for 30 years by now and he is shredded that dude, like 64 years old, you know, is still shredded because it's the yeah. it's exactly what he said, the repetition, because he's like, mm. is in the summertime, he has a garden, but otherwise it's, you know, you know, the farm animals that they have to take care of, the sled dog, uh, you know, with the sled dogs being out and whatnot, you know, those kind of things. And then he has knee problems though, you know, he had to have a knee yeah. surgery, those kind of That's things. Common. Yeah. Unfortunately will come at, at a certain age, but, uh, he did bicycling the way as you do now, you know, and um, even mm. for even for me, it's like sometimes uh, you're, you're overdoing it in just one aspect, like for me, the trail running, you know, so I definitely had yeah. to hop on the bike as well again to, to just uh, get a little bit of a different training and to, because otherwise uh, body parts will take a toll a little bit. <laughs> Wear well. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I had some problems with my, uh, uh, was it called uh in german it's ischias the same as in swedish oh uh, uh, yeah so, you know um, the nerve that's like on your butt cheek and basically mm, goes around the whole body yeah uh yeah sciatica 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 yeah yeah, yeah. yeah exactly and uh that is a common problem like if you're like uh it's also like stiffness because mm. stretching is a big factor as well which i am yeah bad yeah in. absolutely and that yeah. is like something that you probably do a lot with judo as well I guess. Well, with judo, yeah, the, we, we, we stretch at least for 20 minutes before we start to do anything, you know, more physical. Um, yoga, you know, I was doing yoga for a, while, for a while. I had a bad back and this is kind of ironic because, you know, I had a, my desk upstairs uh, in my office um, 
I have a stand-up desk and I've had a stand-up desk for probably 10 years. Okay. And so I would never sit down throughout mm. the course of the day. I would be standing up all the time mm. because there's very good evidence to, to show that um, sitting down for eight hours a day on an office desk, um, some people say have the equivalent health detriment uh, uh, as smoking. I kind of find that hard to believe, but but what okay. I'm trying to say is that mm. is that sitting down for extended periods of time, day in day out, can be very bad for your health. Mm. So I got a stand up desk, and I loved that thing. And for many years, um, I worked purely standing up, and then I just started getting lower back pain. And I couldn't work out what it was. So I started doing yoga and yoga is fantastic. Of course, you know, it's great. It's a great workout. It's great for stretching. Um, and, uh, but the yoga didn't fix uh, the lower back problems as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until I stopped using the stand up desk and started <laughs> sitting down again <laughs> that my, that my back improved, but, but I sit down, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm in my office so little now. Mm. Um, and the key really is to continual movement. Don't yeah. be standing too long. Don't be sitting too long. Don't be laying down too long. Break it up. That's yeah. the kind of life in general. Huh? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's like uh, for me, I actually had this conversation the other day with a guy um, about like, you know, my, my training regimen more or less, you know. And um, I basically said to him like, yeah, the in the summertime now I'm, I'm painting uh, houses and stuff like that, you know, uh, and, uh, you're standing for eight, nine hours. So the, mm. the problem is I'm getting up at like six 30 dealing with my dogs and whatnot, start driving to work. So then I'm sitting for half an hour driving, yeah. uh, standing for like eight, nine hours, you know, and then like driving back for half an hour sitting. And then I just going to deal with my dogs and then I start running. So it's like, mm. uh, for me, it's the, it's basically like, just overworking in, in another aspect, you know, that I, it's like the body takes toll. And I also started to get um, lower back problems. So I have to start stretching a little bit more, you know, and uh, also like yeah. take it back a little bit sometimes and just relaxing because that is, that is the biggest issue. And I guess you have the same problem, like uh, basically forcing yourself to rest as well at a certain time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the rest is really interesting. And, and if I can just talk a little bit about a strategy that I use on my longer polar expeditions mm -hmm. and something that I instill in my, in my guests, you know, particularly on the longer trips, anything more than two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And that is, I, I structure my day around three, eight hour, three, eight hour periods. <laughs> and the most important of those three, eight hour periods to make up the 24 hour day is sleep. Mm -hmm. So I, I always give myself and any people on my team the option of eight hours on their pillow um, and sleeping if they want to take that. Sometimes you'll get people that just don't need that and they would prefer, you know, to be writing in their journal or watching a movie on their iPhone or communicating with their family back at home or whatever. That's up to them. Mm. But, but I do encourage them take eight hours sleep because this is what I'm giving, giving you. And I think the sleep is underestimated. And then the, the second eight hour period is the eight hours of movement. That's literally on your skis with a sled behind you and moving across the ice. Every time you stop to have a break, might be five minutes or a lunch break, maybe 20 minutes. That doesn't include that, that that's not included in that eight hour period. So eight hours, no, okay. eight hours of sleep, eight, eight hours of movement. And then the other eight hours is just the downtime. So that's your breaks. That's your lunchtime. That's your pitching the tent. That's your boiling the water. That's sitting inside your tent, communicating with your, your pals or your tent mates. Mm -hmm. And then if you find that you, you're not getting quite enough distance during the day, you never jeopardize the amount of sleep. You just make your downtime more efficient. So you can add an hour to your hauling time. Your, your hauling time can become nine hours mm -hmm. and your downtime can, can, can become seven hours. Yeah. That could be 10 and that could be six, but you never cut into your sleep time because the sleep is to me the, the most critical component of, uh, of uh, the expedition formula. Yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's definitely a good method because um, you, can, you can really see that uh, I mean, nowadays, what you see a lot is um, 
tracks uh, like watches or so that actually like track your sleeping hours and stuff like that. And those mm. things are getting more yeah. and more in interesting also for for just regular people as well to use to actually see how good of a sleep you're gonna get as well. Mm. Because that is yeah. also well. has has a big influence as well. While we are at the sleep, like uh, at the topic of sleeping, um, what do you use for um, for the different um, different expeditions and so in terms of sleeping bags and stuff like that? Because that is a big big issue that a lot of people also face. Is like what kind of sleeping bag do I use? You know, um, sure. Do you, do you divide that a little bit? Like, I'm oh, sorry, but um, because I mean, obviously, it also depends a little bit on the on the um, on the area that you're going in and how long the expedition actually is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, one of the most critical things is um, what do you, what do you do with the moisture that your body is giving out throughout the course of your time inside a sleeping bag? Mm -hmm. Because throughout the course of a day, your body emits about a liter of moisture through sweating, perspiring, breathing, all of that kind of thing. So a component of that goes into, the, into your sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. If you're in Antarctica and it's summertime and the sun's shining on the tent, you don't have to worry about that because that moisture is going to pass through your sleeping bag into the atmosphere and you won't be, you, you, you don't need to concern yourself about it. Mm -hmm. But as you know, in springtime in Svalbard or on the Arctic Ocean or in wintertime, or in fact, anywhere where you're not getting that solar gain where you're not getting the sunshine and you've got temperatures of let's say colder than minus 20 centigrade then you have to be clever about allowing that moisture not to go into the sleeping bag so for a longer expedition what we do is we use a vapor barrier liner and i'm sure you're aware of that which is a big plastic bag that we slide into and then slide into the sleeping bag so that the moisture that our body gives off is trapped by the, the, the plastic bag. You end up wet in the morning, as you know, because you know, you're know you wearing your base layer and that gets wet from all of the moisture that you're generating, but it's not going into the fibers of the sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. And the reason you don't want that to happen is because the moisture will travel away from your body up to the outside of the sleeping bag but the cold is penetrating down from the outside. So therefore the moisture is coming up and freezing before it gets outside the bag. And that ice of course gets trapped in a sleeping bag. And so maybe after a week, after 10 days, you can feel the crunchiness inside the fibers of the bag. Um, and, and that kind of expedition, you don't want a down sleeping bag or you might, want, you might have a down liner, but you need a synthetic bag like the old Dacron or the, you know, well, synthetic bag. We all know what the synthetic bags are, are mm -hmm. as opposed to a down bag because they tolerate, uh, they tolerate the moisture uh, so much better. Mm -hmm. So on my North Pole expeditions and in Svalbard, where we get very little sunshine, or at least the sunshine is not strong enough to give us warmth inside the tent and dry things out, mm -hmm. then I'll have a two layer sleeping bag and the primary layer is synthetic. And, but for an Antarctica, then I'll just have a pure down bag. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a crazy irony about Antarctica that I, that I discovered 10 years ago when I did a solo expedition on the coast of Antarctica. And this is this weird irony. When you do a coastal trip in Antarctica, which is a long way from the South Pole, right, mm. where you're getting a bigger change in the diurnal shift or the daily height of the sun, much mm. lower during the evening and then much higher during the daytime. When you're on the coast of Antarctica, the sun actually, you see it start to dip and often it goes behind the mountains. And ah. when the sun dips <laughs> or it goes behind the mountains, you know what it's like. It gets cold, right? Yeah, yeah. So there you have this irony. You're a long way from the South Pole, but yeah. you're often much colder on the coast of Antarctica. Yeah. When you're skiing up on the plateau to the South Pole, yeah. when the sun's out, you've got 24-7. So overnight, the sun is beating down on the tent. It's yeah. warm. We're often opening both doors and hoping for a breeze to come through <laughs> because yeah. even though it's 30 below outside, it's like crazy hot on the inside. So easy to dry stuff out. So yeah, yeah they're, they're the two different sleeping systems, but mm -hmm. there are also differences in 
even in the same terrain at different elevations and different latitudes. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, since Fascinating. Were, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, especially like also you see that also in other areas. Like as soon as the sun starts dipping a little bit, and the people like uh, start, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's quite interesting that you're also like. Of course, you you also have the same effect on Antarctica, but a lot of people always just know about the the plateau, basically. You know, so I mean that's what what mm. most. Um, touristic endeavors basically also see because you basically just more or less just start at the plateau right away and you just stay there yeah. so so that's something Often, that, yeah 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 that's some people don't ever experience that as well yeah since we're talking yeah. about gear um let's talk about your company ice track i mean you you developed uh, quite a lot of uh different products i mean mainly of course it's your your ski binding um but also all the other aspects. I mean, you you lately you uh, you put out like your your um, what was it called? Um, the news uh, your new systems basically. What what was it called? Um, basically, where you have like a sleeping, sleeping bag mattress. Yeah, where you have the, the mattress. Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah, sleep system. Yeah, yeah. I call um, that a polar was, swag. And a, a, polar swag, yeah. that's what it was. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't come up with the name. <laughs> yeah. But um, what uh, makes you go for like a certain like new and new systems and, um, and also like uh, just, just improving on the material that you have? Yeah. So uh, it's interesting because in my early days, my early expeditions on uh, Ellesmere Island and Greenland and skiing mm. to the South Pole in 98, um, I had a lot of gear failure. And it's like, damn, this is really annoying, you know, because we have to stop and repair it. Uh, it's uncomfortable sometimes. It doesn't function the way that it should now that it's broken. Mm. Um, and I'm never one to tolerate that kind of thing so i come away from an expedition and i think well how can i improve that how can i make sure that next expedition it doesn't break or it doesn't wear out or it doesn't cause me grief or problems or damage mm. um so i started inventing my own stuff and really my first invention were the ski bindings and i must tell a funny story first because mm. You and I met out in the wilderness of uh, Svalbard. Yeah, I'm sure you remember this. <laughs> of you course were I do. Up a mountain in the in, in, in the mist. It was a gloomy day. Yeah. You were going. We saw you in the distance heading up this uh, this glacier or this valley. <laughs> and we were heading down, and then you came back down, and we had a little chat, and and, and you said, "Hey, are you guys sponsored by Ice Trek?" <laughs> and I said, "Exactly." I said, "No, I am Ice Trek." And it's like, what? <laughs> okay, because you because you had actually been online and looked at looked at our products, I think. Exactly. Um, yeah. That's so exactly that was a, a <laughs> that was a funny little meeting um, way back then, um, and so I developed these ski bindings after I had too many failures of either bindings or boots, and they're so mature in their in their development now that uh you know the u.s military buy them from me i'm currently putting together a quote for the norwegian military and the canadian military as well the norwegians um, you believe say. it or not uh, uh so, sorry well but, uh, it's, it's I mean, only a quote yeah okay yeah it's it, it's not a you know confirm or anything but i have yeah. had interest from uh from the norwegians in the past which is oh, which okay. is to use a very old and and uh ancient and incorrect term is like selling fridges to uh to an eskimo <laughs> you, you know i mean the norwegians really uh you know they they say invented skiing although there's some evidence these days that uh, skiing was invented in china believe it or not oh, okay um, so for yes Yes, yes. So for the Norwegians or any Scandinavian country to be interested in a product made for skiing in Australia mm. uh, is somewhat ironic. Yeah. Um, but the beauty of my ski bindings is, um, and another funny thing is when the Norwegians look at my ski bindings, they say things like, ha, huh, our children <laughs> ski on such bindings, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but, but they do have a purpose. They, um, they're simple to use. 
Um, they don't break. They're using, uh, you know, high level materials that have been tested at uh, crazy temperatures below minus 200 Celsius in, in laboratory conditions. Mm. Um, and they fit just about any type of boot and they're field adjustable without using any tools. Um, and this makes them um, pretty attractive for the military who just like stuff that works, that, that doesn't give them any grief or any problem mm. when they're out in the field. Um, and, you know, it grew from there. We now manufacture our own sleds, our own harnesses, some of our own clothing, particularly extremity wear, hats, mittens, um, face masks, neoprene face masks, also a very big seller. And they've been bought in pretty large quantities by rescue services around the world. Mm. Um, and now looking at, at bedding, you know, because um, I've always used these seat converters, you know, from Thermarest in particular, where you can put your mattress inside mm. and it protects the mattress, but you can also lift the back up and it converts it into a seat because you know, I talked about how important sleep was for, mm. uh, for a polar expeditioner. Well, before sleep, you really need to be resting your back as well. So I always give my guests um, a, a backrest or a seat that they can sit on inside the tent. Because, of course, you spend hours sitting inside your tent, in, you know, watching the water boil mm. um, uh, before you get to sleep. So I develop a sleep system, which is similar to the systems that have been used in Norway for some years, but I added the seat to it and a few other features, and um, yeah, it works. All of my stuff worked. <laughs> yeah, it's um. But but uh, but I I say that a little facetiously, but I also say it from uh, from a place of of um you know serious field testing. Yeah, I'm in a very fortunate position that all of the gear that I invent, mm. I can put to the absolute test. Yeah. Not only just on last degree North and South Pole expeditions and shorter expeditions around Svalbard, but I'm still guiding long expeditions of many hundreds of kilometers to the South Pole. Mm. Um, and my last, you know, North Pole expedition, which was, uh, you know, North Pole to Canada was 2011. That's only nine years ago. Uh, mm. I guess I was almost 50 then. And then we attempted that a second time in 2014. So I'm able to put my products to the test and if they don't pass the test, then they don't go onto the market. They get tweaked and adjusted mm -hmm. until they do pass the test. And then I know that I can be confident in selling them to, uh, to other like-minded people. Yeah, 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 fair enough. Um, yeah, it's like, I mean, I can only talk for, for myself as well. I mean, I'm using the bindings as well. And um, that's the, the funny thing is like, um, for <laughs> um, the funny thing is, like of course, like when you're when you're out on a on a ski expedition and you drag your own sled, as you said before, like you usually um, account for what was it four kilometers per hour? I think is the is the usual usual margin that you basically uh, calculate on. Well, three three kilometers an hour on a guided trip where you've got people right. that you know might be not be at a you know. A, 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 a sort of athletic fitness kind of level and they're not out to break records but three kilometers an hour is on average a, a, a pretty good speed and it's a yeah. very good speed on the arctic ocean of course yeah. where we have open water and rubble yeah of course but yeah, yeah your 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 comment yeah 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 so for me it's like when i'm out on a svalbard expedition with my dogs and i ski next to the sled you know then it's more about like eight to eleven kilometers per hour you know sometimes yeah. depending a little bit on the snow conditions it's maybe like only 10 or so but uh, the speed is completely different i mean for me the, the binding works perfectly for for even mm. for that kind of speed granted oh, that's great you, granted you can't really compare that to um to uh, other terrains like also that you find like in sweden or norway where it's much more up down up down i mean it's far but and, and also sure. in other areas antarctica and whatever you usually have more flat ground there it's a little bit easier but i mean since you mentioned yeah, the norwegians like uh, when you look at the old videos of Norwegians start skiing down with those old ass bindings that are pretty much like yeah. maybe more more floppy and so than than your bindings, yeah. you can see that Absolutely. it actually works. You just have to yeah. uh, have to use what you have, and you have to 
learn yeah. how to use your material as well. How to use it. Yeah. 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 And, and look, I, I telemark in my flexi ski bindings, you know, oh, you so do? they have very good. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I mean, not as a habit, but if I'm, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. if I'm on downhill terrain, you know, yeah, we use course. them here in, in, yeah. in Australia mm. and I put my customers in them there. And if yeah. we have good conditions and a nice slope and good snow, sure. I can, parallel and, and telemark in those yeah. um yeah it's important that they have that good edging capability not just for skiing downhill but you know often you're edging up slopes mm. often you know you're edging up blocks of rubble heading towards the north pole you're herring boning up slopes so it's really important to have that lateral stability yeah. and i've skied too many times in my youth on you know floppy stuff where you can push your heel onto the snow next to your ski yeah, and yeah it, exactly. you know it should be <laughs> flat on the ski you know i mean that's terrible kind of skiing and it's it's for a purpose but it's it's certainly not for polar expeditioning yeah exactly but how is it uh, in terms of boots because um i actually just recently um put out a video about what to wear on gloves and and uh, on, on also on footwear because um I think it's very important because uh, I actually had one person, she has three dogs, I think and they are going, uh, she, uh, she always has a tendency to have like cold feet and whatnot. So I said to her like, um, yeah, maybe not just think about like what you usually wear on a, as a ski binding system basically, but look at um, the ice track binding system as well. And uh, because they're also like going on really long trips over a long period of time and then basically just ski urinating next to the dogs, you know, so the dogs basically hauling the load, you know, and then you just ski next to them attached with a rope. Uh, so I yeah. said to her, like, maybe look into that um, as, a, as an alternative because the, the regular ski binding system usually just allows like a very narrow Specific shoe. Mode. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and that is usually yeah. a problem, yeah. especially for women as well that who tend to have a little bit more cold feet in general, especially, yeah, the older you get as well. I mean, I already see that now, like my hands and limbs are starting to get colder over the years. And that's yeah. just because it takes yeah, a toll on definitely. you as well. But for, yeah. for women in, in older ages, it has a little bit more problem. But um, I basically, I'm a, uh, uh, I love the Stiga Maklas. That's uh, my thing, but they have the huge downside that they're not waterproof. That is the big yeah. issue. So uh, I was wondering like what your take on it is. I mean, I, kind of know it but it's good for for other people to hear as well yeah 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 and and people use my uh use the stiga mucklucks in flexi binding there's mm. there's no problem with that mm. you just get the right size and the right fit and and the, mm. one of the advantages of the flexi binding is that you can use your favorite boot mm. in the binding it doesn't have to be a specialist three pin or triple nbc you know kind of um boot you can literally take the warmest boot in the world and you will fit that inside a flexi binding. So for me, I find that the Stiga Mucklux, yeah, they're, they're not only not waterproof, but they're also, they, they don't have a lot of ankle stability as well. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the other boots like the, the Baffin boots and Lacrosse and, and uh, Sorrells, I guess, have a little bit more stability in the, in the well, maybe, maybe you don't agree, but, um, but for some, they'll, they'd find uh, a little bit more stability depending on which model of course they're using yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I so i of course recommend uh the baffin boots and since they brought out their three pin uh, guide boot baffin guide pro mm -hmm. which either fits into a three pin um binding or a flexi binding um this is a great boot. It's uh, it's really very warm. It's modular, of course. You can pull the inner out and you can dry it out. Uh, and it's got some reasonably good lateral stability as well. Mm. So this is my preferred boot these days. But, you know, if you wanted to go old school and use, you know, their older style impact or endurance boot, which is a much wider binding, really fat, I'm sorry, a, a really a wider boot and a, mm -hmm. a fatter sole on it, that's fine too. They fit inside the flexi bindings as well. Yeah. So for, for women or for guys or for anybody who do suffer cold toes, mm. um, it's going to be worse on a polar expedition when the temperature gets down to 20, 30, 40 below. Mm. You've got to protect your toes um, as you do your fingers and your, your facial extremities from frostbite. Mm. Uh, and if that's left unchecked, not only can it be damaging, but it's extremely uncomfortable and it can make for a pretty... Uh, 
you know, um, uh, uncomfortable trip. But um, since we talked about vapor barriers and sleeping bags, uh, it's very important, if, at least in my opinion, because I'm a big feet sweater, uh, that I'm wearing mm. vapor barriers in my shoes at all times. Obviously, only when I'm moving, not when I'm in my in in the camp. Yeah. Basically, then of course I'm taking it off because uh, otherwise I get trench foot. But um, uh, that is like for me, that's a big thing. But um, what? What is um, th the reason why I squinched a little bit when you mentioned Sorel in particular is because the biggest problem with those shoes is quite often that the sole is extremely stiff, that you can't move, you can't roll your foot in it and whatnot. And that oh, is okay. exactly, mm. um, that, that, is, that is the biggest issue that, that uh, I see quite often uh, is also when you, when you look at- Presses. Yeah, yeah. not only pressing necessarily, but the thing is like, if you can't move your foot in it really, like really roll natural way yeah exactly yeah. you don't get any blood flow really going into the yeah. foot so and that of course causes causes your foot to get cold by just simply not having enough air fl uh, or uh, blood flow going in there mm -hmm. so that is that yeah that's so it gets, yeah that. yeah exactly so it really depends on the style of boot that you've got and of course you know sorel make many different models and they mm -hmm. came out with that massive boot i think it's called the expedition maybe the sorel expedition mm. and it had a, almost an inflexible sole on it yeah um, it still works in my ski bindings i've, mm. I've used them in there but okay. uh, but i would never do a long expedition in those they're, they're kind of more for standing around if you were a worker in a cold environment or you weren't moving around too much on uh, on an expedition yeah. you know for some reason um but uh, um uh, and often we use vapor barrier liners for our feet as well. We certainly never would do that on a South Pole expedition. Um, mm. Again, I, ju I just find it's not required there, but certainly on a, on a North Pole trip or an extended Svalbard trip, you'd want to be using vapor barrier. And that can be something as simple as a, a shopping bag from the supermarket, you know, yeah. anything that's going to prevent the moisture from, uh, from getting into the, into the fibers of your inner boot and some people subscribe to using the intuition liners you know a higher grade intuition liner because they're impervious to water so mm. it, they don't absorb the moisture so yeah, at the end okay. of the day if there's any moisture in there mm. if you know you could pour it out if there was enough but they're usually <laughs> not but you could just get a cloth in there and wipe that out and yeah. dry it out. Whereas, of course, liners of Sorels and Baffins and so on, they would absorb that kind of moisture. So you want to trap it before it, it goes in there. And, you know, there are similar theories in um, for the hands as well. Um, you know, now and again, people use vapor barrier liners for the hands as well. I, I find I've never found a use for that or mm. never found that that's particularly useful for me. Mm -hmm. But the theory that I subscribe to is never to use gloves underneath your mittens. We all have polar mittens, you know, when the temperature gets to minus 20, 30, 40, mm -hmm. you want to be in mittens and not gloves. You want to have your fingers next to each other so they can provide warmth. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people put gloves on and then put their gloves inside a polar mitten. And it's like mm -hmm. you're losing one of the great benefits of skin to skin contact. So mm -hmm. wear a line of mitten inside your polar mitten and then you're going to have much warmer hands and if you make that liner mitten something like a wool liner then for those people who maybe get conditions like uh, frost blisters or chill blains and those kind of things you're much less likely to have reactions if you use a woolen mitten liner with a big polar mitten and shell on top and everything's got to be modular too everything's got to be able to pull it apart hang it up in the tent and dry it out in the evening, as you know. Thank you very much for saying that because uh, <laughs> that is exactly what I explained also in that video. Oh, cool. Because, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, it's because for me, it's quite often like what I in particular said in this, uh, in, in that video as well as that, um, quite often when you're dealing with certain things outside, this glove also gets a little bit wet you know, even if it's just like, you know, wet yeah. snow on it or whatever. And mm -hmm. then this wetness on your, even if it's just a liner glove, like it can be merino boot liner glove or whatever, this clamminess yeah. on your, on your uh, liner glove will automatically also go onto your hands basically. And then you don't get it warm at all. So that yeah. is 
exactly what I talked about as well, because I always like when I have guests, I'm directly say to them, like, if you get, if you feel a little bit cold in your hand, take off your liner glove, put that somewhere, mm. you know, if you're, yeah. if you need to do something with your hands and so put that on for protecting your hand from the direct yeah. uh, wind contact, basically, contact, but, otherwise, yeah. but otherwise just plain hand into the mitten, whatever you into use. Exactly, whatever you use. I, I personally, I don't. I always just have wool, uh, wool mittens on, big ones, yeah. and then just yeah. a just a shell over it because a um, shell, a wind shell. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because for me, it's um, those down mittens. Uh, they are uh, a little bit down is terrible. Yeah, and they're no, also I don't like, like down either. They're also like the problem quite often with those fancy ass mittens. They are not only expensive, but they're also extremely fragile, the material. So once you have a little rip on it with a down, down mitten, like, as you know, that thing is just like explodes and all the yeah. down is gone. And then you're, you, yeah. then those things are bloody useless, yeah. you know? So, yeah, uh, no, no, you need a, you need a polar mitten of a, um, of a fabric also that doesn't move around. Well, one of the other problems with down mittens is that when you put them in your ski poles and then you have the straps around your poles, all of that down moves around inside the mitten. And so mm. you feel that your hands are rolling around on the, <laughs> on the handle of the ski poles. Okay. That's the worst feeling. So, so you actually <laughs> need something like a really thick pile or a really thick woolen mitten. Mm. Um, you don't want a synthetic fill or a, or a, um, uh, or a down fill, you know, that's loose on the inside. It's got to be a, a, a fleece or a wool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always good to hear that from, uh, also like for, for other people to hear, like from, from people that are much, much more experienced than I am. So it's good to, uh, to just get that out there because it's, it's quite yeah. a problem because it's like, if, if you're, once you're a little bit cold and uh, it's very hard to, to get that body warmth back in. And uh, mm. for, for uh, you and I, it's a, it, that's the biggest job is to keep those people not only warm, but also yeah. happy during a trip. So yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. Exactly. So it's good to, to just prep the people as much as possible. Also for their, for their own adventures, just going outside, like in the backyard, you know, just uh, when yeah. it's cold outside. So, so they have like the best, uh, the best experience that they can, you know, out there. Otherwise people are getting easily discouraged as well, like to go out outside. Yeah. So um, since you haven't, uh, since you mentioned Marty, your daughter uh, before, um, how, um, I just want to segue a little bit into mentorship for a short period of time i know that you're um over the years you you basically i mean that also accounts for me as well that you're trying to encourage people that have certain certain knowledge and just want to improve on that basically i mean uh, we can also talk a little bit about, about the ipga the international polar guide association that you help founding um it's uh what is your take on mentorship and also like um maybe also talk a little bit about, about Marty that you just helped her grow mm. a little bit in that, because I know that she, um, wasn't she also, uh, didn't she graduate on the same outdoor school as you did or was she on a different uh, one? Well, it's a, it's a similar theory and philosophy mm. if you like, but it's yeah. a different school. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yet, yeah. So interestingly, my daughter, Marty, uh, who's now 24 and has a mm. master's in, in outdoor education, um, and the, the connection there is that I was one of the first two people to graduate in Australia with a graduate diploma in outdoor education. So, um, so this has been my passion. It's been my livelihood. It's been my life, I guess, for, you know, the last 45 years or so. Um, and when Marty was born, she immediately became part of my adventures even as a baby as a child i would put her in the backpack and off we would go hiking and skiing she'd be in the kayak and we'd go paddling um and back in those days i was really into rollerblading when i lived in melbourne all right in like <laughs> and so I, I would get her in you know the jogger prams the three wheel prams that you see the joggers running around. Ah, yeah yeah those ones yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I would strap her in there i'd put a helmet on she'd have uh, elbow and knee pads yeah. and I, I made a full body harness inside this three-wheel pram <laughs> and I'd get on my rollerblades 
and I would go screaming down the footpaths along the foreshore. We lived in Melbourne on the foreshore, you know, near the beach. And, and I remember at first, you know, I'd be on all three wheels and, you know, taking it gently. Mm. And then it's like, I think I can go a little faster. And then it's like, <laughs> uh, I, I sort of like to weave around people and bends in the track. And it's like, if I go back on the rear two wheels, I mm. can get more maneuverability. And then after a week or two of cocking the back thing back on the two, it's like, actually, you know what? One wheel works best. So <laughs> if I had, so I, so I could start, you know, cocking back on the, the rear two wheels and then coming up on one wheel <laughs> and Marty would be holding on to the pram on both sides. Yeah. And I kid you not, her, the first word she ever spoke was faster. This, <laughs> this is, I, I have a recollection of, uh, of this that, uh, that she immediately knew that she was having fun and she always had a big smile on her face. Um, and it got to the point where we would go into the, into the skate parks. Mm. And I would just have people lining the outside of the skate parks, watching this crazy guy with his daughter in the pram, you know, doing, doing re-entries and stuff. It was so, so much fun. So she grew up on, she drew, grew up on those kind of urban adventures and we quickly went into the outdoors and to, um, you know, all sorts of things. And, and then it got to the point where she became interested in doing stuff by herself. And she walked one of the major walks here in Tasmania called the Overland Track. It's a world, uh, a world class heritage, world heritage listed um, area. And she did that by herself at 15. And I knew that okay. at that point, I knew that at that point that the outdoors really was her thing. Mm. And after that, she just, took it by the horns and off she went. She studied uh, six, uh, th four years at uni, um, as I said, ending up with a master's in, uh, in outdoor education. And she now works as both uh, a sessional staff member at schools and she also does some guiding with me. So mm -hmm. I'm working as a mentor with her, but also as a co-guide. Is it... Um... I mean, uh, yeah, with with Marty, that's that's why. But um, I read that you also like went on a ski expedition with her just by herself, huh? uh, like you two guys in 2016 or so. In in Svalbard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that? Uh, yeah, that's right. So was that basically like your first initial base, uh, initial ritual, basically, or to to get outside yeah, and then like some start? Ways. Oh, sorry, keep on no, going. No, no, she sorry. she had a, a she, yeah, she had a long lead up to this yeah. uh, expedition in Svalbard. It was nine days. It was a particularly cold trip. It was her first introduction into those kind of um, temperatures. Yeah. She had actually been to Antarctica before when she was ten. We went down on a cruise ship. I was working as a guide on board a cruise ship, so I negotiated oh. with the owner. Well, <laughs> uh, can I bring my family too? So my son was four, Marty was uh, ten, yeah. and we went to East Antarctica. We went to um, Mawson Huts and uh, Macquarie Island, and so that was her first introduction to a polar environment at the age of ten. Of course, which is not unusual for people living in Svalbard or you know northern Sweden or northern Canada who grow up in polar environments essentially. Uh, but for an Aussie girl, you know that was a, a great introduction. And then this trip in Svalbard, we did. She hauled her own sled. She would light the stove. She'd help me put the tent up. You know, do all of the things that you need to do as a contributing member to an, uh, of an expedition. And um, and she now comes regularly on my expeditions, particularly in Svalbard and on my Australian guided trips as well. And uh, it won't be too long before she'll be guiding uh, by herself without me there to, uh, you know, to give her some tips here and there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but do you see like, um, do you sometimes talk about um, with her about like her experience back in the days? Because the thing is, I sometimes getting asked like, yeah, well, uh, can my kid go on a trip or something like that? You know, in particular, a certain age, uh, I had a, a guy I knew uh, from Berlin, actually. He said like, yeah, I want my daughter to experience the, the Arctic before it's basically gone. Um, mm. And she was like 
five at the time and i said like nah it's a little bit early wow. at certain yeah i mean it, it's like i mean not like going on six days or something like that just like for a day yeah. or so you know so on a, on a longer sure. trip and i'm saying like it uh, can be tricky for kids because it's quite often like not only the they basically getting cold and then they don't really experience yeah. anything of course yeah. that's a little bit more yeah. extreme but um it's of course there is um there's a certain threshold that some some kids mm. basically don't don't really uh remember what they actually experienced back in the day so yeah I mean, yeah for, for her it's a bit different because she got like you know experienced it over a long 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 period throughout of time. her life yeah exactly yeah, that's so right. Yeah. So I guess there's yeah. a little no, bit of that, but well, 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 you know, there's also a very good reason why, you know, for the Antarctic operators, they have a minimum age of 16. Mm -hmm. um, they won't allow anyone um, younger than 16 mm -hmm. to to board the flight, you know, to, to to go to Antarctica. Cruise ships are a little bit different because they're much more controlled environment and controlled much more from the ship onto land and back onto the ship. But mm -hmm. certainly to fly down, 16, 16 is the limit. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and there's good, there, there's good reason for that because of course they need a lot of care and attention. Um, and and the, the, the very young ones don't know how to express often that they're cold and miserable and they mm -hmm. express it in different ways that you hope the parents would pick up on, but mm -hmm. they might just be, <laughs> you know, too concentrating on the, taking photographs or mm -hmm. you know following the guide or whatever yeah. but um but uh but i did guide a 14 year old girl to the north pole mm -hmm. uh and then that same girl across greenland when she was 15 and then to the south pole on a 600 kilometer expedition when she was 16. Mm -hmm. um but she she had she grew up in a in, in an adventuring environment as, as well. Her, her mm -hmm. dad had climbed the seven summits and they had had various adventures. She would trekked to Everest, you know, base camp. So she was well within her means to undertake those trips, mm -hmm. um, but it's not for everyone. And for those parents who are pushing their kids into doing something and the kids really don't want to be doing it, that's where we should be drawing the line. Yeah, that's that's also where you probably saw like uh, the difference between your two kids, because as far as I remember, like your, your son is much more into music than uh, actually yeah. into the outdoors. That's yeah. uh, where yeah, that absolutely. threshold came in place, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I was very careful um, never to push him into doing things that, that he really didn't feel comfortable doing or wanting to do. Hmm. We, we, as a family, hiked that same overland track that my daughter did when she was 15. Um, and my son was only seven when he did that, mm. but with a very small, lightweight backpack, you know, we carried pretty much everything. Mm. And his favorite part of the entire walks was getting to the huts and at the hut, there was a helipad and then he could start doing his dance moves and, uh, and cartwheels <laughs> on the helipad at the end of every day. Uh, uh, and, and we loved watching him doing that too. That was the yeah. way that he engaged with nature, mm -hmm. um, and the hiking and all that kind of stuff. It's like, ah, uh, ho-hum. <laughs> yeah yeah it's more like you know necessary necessary yeah. means basically necessary then you could do... evil between camps. exactly <laughs> yeah fair enough what i always find interesting like since you said it like in terms of like expressing their emotion when you when you were a kid or so it's uh the the more quiet a kid gets uh the more uh you can see like a, or i mean you have both ways either they're crying or so because that is like one one way of emotion but the the quiet ones uh, are the ones that you really have to focus on because it's um as they you see like because that is what what uh parents sometimes don't really pick up on it's like uh okay the kid gets quiet and there's a reason to it why that kid gets quiet mm -hmm. it's usually because yeah, they're cold right. as hell or they have to pee yeah. Simple as that, yeah. you know, just like that. That's that's funny. I, was, I, I had that several times on day trips, in particular, you know, with uh, because on on longer trips, it's it's usually normal, you know. It's like, oh yeah, I have to pee. I just go around the block, basically, you know, it's like over a little hump yeah. or whatever or whatever. It is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, on a, on a day on day trips, it's quite often that um, also women don't really address that they actually have to pee or so. So it's quite often yeah. like all of a sudden it's getting quiet when you were talking you know and then all of a sudden it gets a little required over the time you know over over a couple of minutes and then i'm quite often like hey um you're so quiet 
Do you have to pee? Oh, yes. Go behind that little snow slope and go, exactly. go do your stuff. Yeah, exactly. I usually like plan it accordingly, you know, like, that I see like, okay, there is something coming up, you know, it's like, hey, by the way, uh, there is there is something around the corner there, you know, it's like, do you have to pee? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, there yeah, you go. And everyone, zoop. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So um, the uh, International Polar Guys Association, um, of course, lately it's it's a little bit more into your mind in your mind as well due to the fact that uh we had some con controversy uh in the last last year or so um but uh, and in the long run i also hope to be part of it and <laughs> be right. submitted to it you. yeah well yeah. i mean at the moment it just depends on uh just doing another bigger trip and whatnot you know so to actually be be able or or uh have the credibility basically to get in there but um what what made you found the uh, association in the first place and yeah. how is it growing as well lately yeah this so um you know i've been guiding north pole expeditions every year except for this year because of covid and last year because there was a controversy between russia and uh, norway and ukraine as you as you know yeah. uh, but 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 aside from those things been guiding every year since 2004 and had my first expedition to the private expedition to the north pole in 2002 so you know i was becoming you know really attached to guiding and, and that and that's not by accident of course because i was trained in outdoor education and worked in outdoor education um you know for many years before that so education is part of my history it's part of my you know my makeup so looking at professionalizing this industry of people taking clients out into the polar field was something that i saw needed to be done and part of the reason of that was that in the early days, I would see someone who was a customer the year before yeah. return to Svalbard with a group of people in the hope that they would then guide them to the North Pole. Mm -hmm. um, and the basis of their experience was one last degree, 100 kilometer plus expedition mm -hmm. to the North Pole. And I saw this happen a few times and, mm -hmm. and also some you know some pretty poor practices against you know by some of the some of the um, other operators and i thought to myself you know mountain guiding has been around uiagm you know and other mountaineering organizations associations have been around for more than 100 years mm -hmm. okay granted it's a bigger environment there are more mountains around the world than there are polar environments and there are more people doing mountaineering than polar guiding mm -hmm. but i did see a necessity for professionalizing our industry mm -hmm. um so getting people to be more responsible for their actions professionalizing their skills upskilling um and having a greater level of care for the people who are who are in their trust mm. so uh so i started putting a word out to some of the more notable people uh people like victor boyarski um borg ausland um richard weber alain hubert uh, matty mcnair you know some mm. you know some really uh, well-known names in the in the polar industry who were also guiding at the time and they agreed that yeah we should do something about this so we put together a little steering committee this is way back in maybe 2009 or something mm -hmm. and there was a really wide and firm belief that something needed to be done yeah. and if we fast forward very quickly from there we established um, we created the association we are registered in Canada um, and now as of uh, today uh, we've received I think maybe our 35th or 40th application or so. Mm -hmm. um, we've just had a uh, we've just had our first Dutchman apply, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and we have um, endorsed guides from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, f from all the typical countries. You know, I guess like Norway and Canada, and um, uh, but but also less typical countries like um, Australia and uh, France and uh, uh, the USA. You know, it's not a particularly mm. big um, uh, polar nation. And um, 
we discuss, we generate uh, guidelines and manuals, um, and we are very proud of this, um, you know, this association that we've uh, created and continue development. And um, we hope that it continues to do that well into the future. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, um, of course, like the reason, the reason plan that you put out was basically um, uh, sort of put out guidelines about like how an expedition is actually received in terms of like what is the, uh, the basically the categories um, basically describing that because that, like I said before, that was the big controversy lately as well. Yeah. Uh, from a person who basically did exactly what you just described, who have been on a on the last trip and then went out by himself. Luckily, he yeah. wasn't guiding yet, but um, yeah. that's that's pretty much what it ha what happened. But um, yeah, yeah. So this was in some ways was an offshoot of mm. of um, you know the polar industry that mm. guides and others have become involved in. And, uh, you know, of course, the person you're talking about is Colin O'Brady, who did yeah. that uh, ski crossing of Antarctica, mm -hmm. of the Antarctic landmass, we should say, not including yeah. the ice shelves, you know, that are attached to the outside. And then making some pretty bold and unjustified claims about what he did, mm -hmm. some of which was truthful, but most of which was, um, uh, you know, really pulling the wool over people's eyes. So this was another thing that I became very interested in was to, to develop a classification system mm. for polar expeditions. How do we label an expedition? What terms do we use? What terms should we no longer use because they're confusing? And a good example mm. of this is um, people might claim to have done a solo, unsupported, unassisted crossing of Antarctica. That's what Colin O'Brady claimed at the time. And it's like, Okay, solo, that kind of makes sense. I think that means that you're just going to be by yourself and you're not going to travel with another person. Mm -hmm. Unsupported, maybe half the population knows what unsupported means. Mm -hmm. And, you know, traditionally that meant you're not going to take a resupply from a plane that comes in. You're not mm -hmm. going to have a car drive in and put some resupplies in. You're not going to take food that you didn't deliver, you know, yourself mm -hmm. or you didn't carry. That's mm -hmm. unsupported. But the vast majority of people had no idea what unassisted meant, mm. you know. So, uh, so I found that we could just eliminate this unassisted word from the vocabulary because mm. what unassisted basically meant was that people were not using kites or wind power, mm -hmm. you know. It's like, but hang on, kiters don't consider themselves as being assisted. What are mm. they being assisted by? Kiters are just kiters using mm. the Antarctic platform or the Arctic or Greenland platform mm. to do their craft, which is snow kiting. And yeah. skiers use the same platform to ski. Mm. Dog sledders use the same environment and platform, platform to dog sled. Mm. So I thought, let's get rid of the unassisted and categorize each of these different disciplines or modes of travel. So mm. now someone skiing across Antarctica by themselves, not using any resupplies. Now we would say that instead of unsupported, unassisted, that would be a solo unsupported ski crossing of Antarctica. And immediately we see the difference between a solo unsupported snow kite crossing of Antarctica or a yeah. solo unsupported dog sled crossing of Antarctica, which of course you can no longer do because in 1993, I think it was, they banned dogs yeah. from, from, the Antarctica, from Antarctica. Yeah. So, so this, that, that's a very uh, scaled down simplification of the Polar Expeditions Classification Scheme. It now runs at about a 30 page document. So, <laughs> yeah. you, uh, you, I, mean, I mean, if you pulled out just a single word out of your mind and said, is that in your lexicon down in your, you know, your glossary of terms? Mm -hmm. It probably is because we spent the last <laughs> yeah. year and a half, almost two years since Colin O'Brady um, expedition mm. we spent two years a dedicated team of us um, putting together this classification scheme we are now in partnership with uh, Guinness World Records mm. um, they now use PEX as their adjudicating tool to determine uh, yes or no whether someone holds a record or breaks a record in, yeah. in a polar environment. So we're, we're very proud of this and we see this as being a, a very functional tool for people to use in the future. Yeah, you can really see that, um, especially term, uh, the term expedition even is, 
is a is a very a controversial term because it's been used in 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 aspects that are like not necessarily i mean for me also like when it comes to sled dogs and so the amount of people using the term expeditions on on trips on on the you know in sweden on a on a uh, you know you, you know how it looks road. like you know and it's like not necessarily road but you know you always yeah. have trail markers yeah. and every everything you know uh, going from hut to hut and stuff like that that is always called an expedition you know so yeah. i'm always a little bit like when when it comes to those kind of terms uh i'm, I'm always a little bit uh uh yeah, dubious about uh, about yeah. the use oh well look even yeah. even I mean, people that, that, i've yeah sorry yeah I, i've met I've met people on a cruise ship who've gone from, you know, Ushuaia to Antarctica said, yes, I just did an expedition to the South Pole. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. what? Well, hang on. <laughs> you're saying you did, you, you actually did a cruise to Antarctica, but you're calling it a, an expedition to the South Pole. It's yeah, like, exactly. You yeah. can't get a cruise <laughs> ship to the South Pole for starters. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those, those kind of terms that are really funny. And when it comes to O'Brady as well, it's a lot is, um, media coverage and uh and also like uh you know using uh, the media tools to actually get what you want and that is uh, yeah, yeah. and that is it's quite interesting that um a lot of people just i mean that that includes both of us are uh, in terms of marketing yourself uh that sure. is that is of course like the big uh, the big issue and it's uh, quite interesting to see like how much uh you can actually uh just fool in brackets fool people sure. in 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 uh in terms of like what what you have achieved and just yeah. make a living out of that i mean that goes also into like telemarketers and whatever you know it doesn't not necessarily only expeditions and whatnot you know but it's um sometimes uh we just uh people who actually know what those kind of things are about are like yeah well those are idiots, you know, they're just like claiming something. But in the end, we should sometimes maybe also look into like how they actually achieve those kind of goals, actually fooling the people to be able to actually maybe um, being able to to uh, uh, lecture or uh, other the people actually about like what it's really about, you know, so sometimes. Well, well, this is really is, important. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and this is, you know, what one of the ways that we've let down the public in the past is mm -hmm. not giving them a tool to educate themselves about yeah. mm -hmm. prior to at the moment we're building a, a dedicated website for the polar expeditions classification scheme mm -hmm. so okay. that people can finally go to a single source mm -hmm. and find out what is the definition of an expedition what is the definition of snow kiting what is the definition of uh, an ice shelf and the Antarctic landmass, and what does it mean to ski to the North Pole? Mm -hmm. um, what does what is a reverse expo? All of those things they can go, finally go to the one single source. And as part of that, you're probably aware too that I drew up um, a series of maps. Yeah, you yeah. know that, that that educated people on who's done what before, mm -hmm. so people can look at these maps and they can say, well, has anybody skied from um, Berkner Island uh, to the South Pole unsupported in less than 50 days, for example. Mm -hmm. And finally, there's a resource that you can go into and, and look at that. Or is, is it still possible to do a new route from the outer edge of the Ross Ice Shelf through the Transantarctic Mountains to the South Pole? The map will tell you which routes have been done and mm -hmm. therefore, it's easy to determine which routes haven't been done. So, okay. uh, so this is still this is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. We hope for it to be completed before the end of the year. Okay. And so, finally, the general public, the, the expedition community, and the media can finally go to a source and discover what can be done, what has been done, what, what can never be done, and how mm -hmm. to label these things that will be done and has and have been done. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I mean, you see that in other in other outlets. Uh, like, if you look at, um, do you, I don't know if you're aware, but fastest known times. Are you aware of that no, website? No, I'm not aware of it. No. Um, it's basically what it means. is like um, you you have a route that is established in one way or another, and then um, you also have those kind of categories, which is like supported, unsupported, or self-supported. Those kind of three categories. 
Yeah. Uh, and then it's uh, in, in particular, in this case, it's for runners mainly, you know, uh, and then um, you just run or pass hike or whatever you do. Uh, it's like, um, like in this case, like the Northern Kungsleden part or whatever, you know, there's a time um, established. And so in, in those different categories, uh, and that is like in particular, like, uh, or for climbing, it's a little different. But there is those kind of things as well, like uh, mm, which yeah. are just differently yeah. nail labeled. But you don't have this um, specific website where you can find all those infos, and that's mm. where, in particular, for running fastest known times, is quite interesting uh, because you it's, have I, a I, map I, that is also coming yeah, together, you know, so, as well. Yeah, exactly. and I, I like the fact that they call it fastest known times because there's a yeah. kind of a caveat there because well they're the ones we know about because of course yeah. now and again you'll get people that fly under the radar yeah. that have no interest in getting media coverage or telling mm -hmm. people about what they've done they don't have a website they probably don't even have any social media and they mm -hmm. just have a pack on their back and maybe a pair of runners that are 10 years old and mm -hmm. go off and do these things and no one ever knows about them and they yeah. may hold a world record yeah, so exactly. fastest known time, <laughs> I, I think that's a very wise um, label to use. Uh, and, and you have to admire people that, that do that kind of thing. But, mm. you know, within our PEX classification scheme, we say mm. we totally support people that want to do that. Mm. And, and if, if possible, please let us know what you've done. But yeah. the moment they get online, the moment they publicize themselves, and the moment that they use terminology that compares their expedition with another expedition, mm. then they get absorbed by our classification scheme because mm. then they've made the decision that they're in the public domain. And once yeah. they're in the public domain, then they have to be graded equally together with everyone who's come before them mm -hmm. and everyone who will follow. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is a fair point. I mean, that's uh it's quite interesting because uh, that is pretty much our nature as well. Like uh, just mm. getting basically put everything into category to be able to grab it as well, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to grasp like, or, or just yeah. measure ourselves as well. Like that is sure. also, of course, yeah, yeah. unfortunately, since um, expeditions per se in, in, uh, in, in our modern society is a little bit different measure than it used to be. Now it's less about exploring, but actually to, yeah to uh, achieve a certain goal rather than yeah. actually exploring yeah that's area. right yeah and that's why the you know it, it's very common these days for people to break speed records mm -hmm. and this is one of the things that we we've been working on with the pex committee uh, in the last month or so um, diagnosing exactly what it means to break a speed record or even to set a speed record. In fact, we've agreed that there's no such thing as setting a speed record mm. because you only, the record only becomes set once somebody follows it. No, they I, I, either do it faster, they either do it faster or they do it slower. You cannot say that you've set a speed record if you're the only person that's done it because you are both the fastest, but you're also the slowest as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so don't go claiming a speed record because they're, uh, you know, that's uh, it's a two two sided point. <laughs> that is a fair point. All right, Eric, we're already talking for one and a half hours or so. Thank you very much for wow. being a part. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, it was great. Yeah, it was great to hear your voice again. Like, I mean, the last time we saw each other was like two years ago or something like that. Yeah, over a coffee yeah. on Svalbard. I mean, and long year did exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. So well, I hope we can do that again um, in March or April next year. Yeah, would be a pleasure. Uh, that would be great. It's always great to catch up with you. Um, well done on the podcast series. It's Thank a great. You. Um, it's a great initiative. I hope that all goes well. And uh, say hello to your dogs. I will. Me. I will. Thank you very much. <laughs>